IEEE Cloud Computing Initiative and the IEEE Computer Society. So please join us. You'll have an opportunity to talk to our panel, ask them further questions. But uh, to begin, let me, uh, let me ask a question uh, uh, of, uh, of the panel myself. Uh, so we've heard, we've heard about open standards. We've heard about uh, de facto standards. We've heard mention of de jure standards, various kinds of standards in the cloud computing space. Uh, there is a, uh, a history in the personal computer wave, which, which uh, we've, uh, we've seen for quite a long time, of proprietary uh, microprocessor architectures. And uh, for the most part, uh, although there's been some uh, exceptions, like, uh, like Spark and, uh, and MIPS, uh, for the most part, the PC uh, revolution, in the past at least, was powered by proprietary architectures. So in the cloud computing space, um, do you think uh, that uh, we'll have uh, a proliferation of proprietary clouds that will represent uh, the majority of, uh, of the cloud computing vendors? Or are we going to have a majority of cloud computing IT coming from standards-based clouds. Who'd like to take a gander at that? Yes. <laughs> well, that covers both, both options. So. so, no, in other words, I think you're going to find that there's a mix of both uh, standards and you're going to, you know, it's the usual uh, thing around uh, standards and convergence versus divergence for product differentiation. So you're going to find, uh, you know, an increasing evolution of standards, but at the same time, people will build on those and either directly or indirectly achieve some sort of lock-in as a result of their, you know, their corporate competitive strategy. Um, so I'd like to just add to that. Um, I think definitely currently in the initial cloud space, we do have proprietary standards or proprietary implementation of uh, cloud-related standards. I just make the point that from a customer perspective, when we look at it as a major investor from the government perspective, one of the reasons that um, that is not comfortable in the long term is that it's very important that when we make a big investment, a $20 billion investment on behalf of the taxpayer, that that investment not become prematurely technologically obsolete. So that's one reason for wanting standards. And the other reason has to do with the level playing field that's been mentioned several times, not just for U.S. companies, but uh, globally. If we expect U.S. companies to be able to compete large and small, then um, we need standards that will do the same thing for international firms. I, mean, I, I think that uh, what we've seen over the past few years is a lot of differentiation. I think, I think you see products emerge and companies emerge with products that rapidly capture the imagination of markets. Uh, and, and in this case, we've, we've seen some de facto standards emerge around cloud, uh, Amazon uh, being a great example. Um, is this good for innovation in the long run? I think it's terrible. And I, and I think where you've seen companies that have had near monopolistic power uh, around markets, you've seen lack of innovation. And I think that's about to happen in the uh, PC hardware space today. Uh, one, of, one of my uh, colleagues in, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, Andy Bechtelsheim, uh, has invented the term needless differentiation. Um, this is something that hardware vendors do to lock you into their platforms. They needlessly differentiate their products. They don't innovate them. They don't differentiate them. They needlessly uh, add features. Um, a good example of this is the rack. You know, servers come in racks. They're 19 inches wide. Uh, you can buy a Dell server, an HP server, or any number of second tier servers and put them in the rack, and that's a good thing. Um, the problem is the blade, right? Once you, once you buy, buy a blade chassis from a particular vendor, the blade could be a standard, but it's not. And so companies get, government agencies get put in positions where they can't select the best value for their stakeholders because they've already made an investment that needlessly locks them into a particular product from a particular company. And so I think there's a lot of danger when there's lack of innovation uh, and, and there's lack of standards. I think uh, as long as we see standards try to uh, standards emerge when, they're, when they're, it's time to move on and, and, and innovate, uh, we're, in a, we're in a good position. I learned a lot from all of you. 
Um, I would like to raise a little bit more on the knowledge side and less on calcification, which is absolutely required. I'm not objecting. Uh, I liked everything. So I, I think it's probably a question for David, maybe to a lesser extent for Chris. What are the technical assumptions that you have made uh, and choices? For example, are you starting with Amazon Web Services? Uh, are you going to use o OVF, uh, you know, REST interfaces? What are the decisions that you made that you haven't made? Uh, and then the, the second question, uh, in terms of criteria of success, what will be your success tactical goals? Are your goals, for example, to get into OpenStack, to have uh, major vendors use it? And, and, and how, how do you know you'll succeed? So those are great questions. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. You asked. Um, so on the uh, the intercloud efforts. Um, so uh, I guess um, a number of the the choices that the working group has has made have mostly been around proposals where certain te you know to not reinvent the wheel. So for example, um, uh, in areas uh, that have to do with trust. Uh, there's a lot of existing technologies that are great and people really understand and so therefore trying to repurpose some of those into this new do domain is, is, is terrific. Uh, also things like you know conversations for clouds to find each other, presence and then be able to talk to each other. Uh, trying to leverage protocols like chat protocols like XMPP are, are, are great choices. And, you know things like uh, a SIP were looked at and, and teams have made evaluations and and, uh, and put that out there for, for folks to make choices. But I think the idea has been to try to use a lot of technologies which are already well accepted, already uh, open source where possible, multiple implementations, and, uh, and, and reuse as much as possible. Now that said, um, you know, a cloud is different because it's not just, you know, where a pa it's not a unidimensional thing. It's not a packet that needs to go somewhere. There's, in fact, probably the kinds of resources we get from cloud today are probably just a teeny fraction of what we'll get in the future. So the team has tried to speak to a semantic definition of cloud resources, use some of the latest thinking in semantic web to make it extensible kind of architecture uh, around that. Now, you know, as with any of these um, uh, approaches, um, you know, you can have a great architecture and nobody uses it. So the idea is to try, especially what we've tried with announcing the test bed and so on, is to, is to really put this in concert with a real life, you know, uh, uh, implementation. Kind of like the early days of the public internet um, was put it out there and, and try and have the exact lockstep mix of an implementation along with a, a standards development. Um, we do see that a handful of, of companies, there are folks who are OpenStack based companies that are contributing and will probably have reference implementations around that. There are folks who like uh, Microsoft and VMware who are participating who may or may not, uh, I would assume that's why they're at the meetings, try to you know, adopt these technologies just the way they use TCP IP and, and other open you know, technologies along the way. But you know, the proof's in the pudding, right? People are either going to, it's going to emerge as an interoperable intercloud in the world uh, some way or another. Um, we hope that we move the ball forward with an alternative that uh, gets used. If not, we have had a great set of experiments that probably contributed to the one that, that did work. E either way, we're, you know, we're, we're moving the ball forward and that's, that's the objective really of, of, a, of a technology development group. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I can go on if no one's asking. Well, you. You think you have to step back and then get back in line and then okay. come back in. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, next. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my naive impression is that IEEE was extremely successful in standardizing networks, 802.11, et cetera. Um, so, and, and, and maybe less so in other standards. I might be wrong, but that's my impression. So are you going to leverage that experience to, um, ride on the successes and, and be careful of, you know, other aspects? Well, a couple other, I guess I'll, it's the guy running one of these standards, I'll try and answer that. So, um, yeah, there have been, I mean, you know, the parallel port was a great success, by the way, and mm -hmm. I think Steve, you had something to do with that, if I remember right, back in the day. So it wasn't just Ethernet. <laughs> no, I think the, uh, the IEEE, uh, not only, um, has several dimensions that brings uh, to the table. And one of the things in cloud computing which is quite interesting, it's not just a collection of standards, but there's also, um, there's also things like uh, 
uh, registration authorities. So for example, in the Ethernet domain, one of the key elements that the IEEE brought to the table was the MAC address registration authority. Uh, you know, so that MAC addresses are, have a unique namespace and networks actually interoperate. Those are the kinds of things around namespace that you have to consider in some of these standards that are like beyond quote standards. Also, the fact that um, many sta quote standards organizations don't actually have a community of researchers. So one of the interesting pieces of this equ of these equations with things like cloud here is we've got a pretty we've got a great uh, community of researchers. All you folks in the audience, we've got publications where people just you know publish articles and and so on. We have conferences, and the idea is to create the synergies around these things to help uh, uh, not develop standards in a let's say you know a glass house, but to to actualize these things. More, in a more modern and living kind of way with test bed, papers, research, standards, you know, governance, all those pieces put together. And I think that's why IEEE is maybe in a, that's why, you know, we we brought, we being the team of researchers who started thinking about intercloud and so on, brought this to the IEEE and said, let's do something because we think there's more to it than, than you know, um, than just a standard. Okay, let, let, me, let me just mention um, a, a feature of IEEE standards, and, and I think Don alluded to this, uh, which is that uh, IEEE standards are an open, consensus-based, voluntary standards process. The, uh, the implication of that means that uh, there may be multiple standards in a particular space, uh, and further implication is that some of them may not be successful. Um, uh, Dave, David mentioned the parallel port, port standard. Very few, uh, very few laptops have a parallel port uh, nowadays. But there was an IEEE standard standardizing the uh, the parallel port interface, which had been developed by Centronix, but not particularly well specified. Uh, but there's other standards that were created um, and uh, and did, and weren't successful, and that's not a bad thing in the uh, in the process it's a good thing because we let the marketplace decide other standards organizations um, create standards that are mandated by law and uh, that has a, a number of potentially negative consequences I said the the value equation for working in an organization like JTC one or IEEE is that it's voluntary it is non-regulatory in nature and it it does allow you to get together and to produce a standard that is not the best. And, and from, from my Oracle hat, that's bad. I don't like sending my engineers out to work on something that, that doesn't win it in the marketplace because that's, you know, wasted effort. But from a much bigger perspective, the kind of perspective Joe's talking about, you know, you look, look, look at a societal perspective that what you want is the ability to establish standards and then allow the marketplace to select those standards and, and not because, because this, uh, the possibly, you know, wrong standard gets anointed in law. Okay, not basically end up squashing innovation and possibly even imposing on, on, on you know, for a very long period of time some very dysfunctional capability that, uh, that, that results often in the no standardization, sort of like the worst case. So, so from my perspective that we need to look at standard setting options and they're very, they're varied. And, but we need to understand the world in which we, we're dealing. There certainly are uh, countries, societies, cultures in, in the world that would very much like the certainty of a single standard. And they want to be able to say, this is the standard, we want it now, and we're going to impose it, and, and you're going to have to build it to sell into my country. Okay. Well. If that's the right standard and the rest of the world thinks it's a good standard too, then maybe, maybe those of us provide product and provide a single standard to sell into a worldwide market. But if it's not the right standard, that's probably not how you want those standards to be selected. And so okay. yeah, there may be others that have a comment on this. Please. 
Yeah. The telephone companies have spent decades defining their called the telephony cloud services in the management domain. And I think uh, the complexity and the degree of heterogeneity of cloud service management domain has been under underestimated. We have heard a lot about the cloud resource provision API, but in my personal experience, is the degree of heterogeneity in managing the cloud service itself is much, much higher and much, much more costly than the in design implementation for the cloud resource provision API. So I'm uh, wondering how exactly the standard committee is going to address that issue so that we can, for example, learn from the Tenafly industry on how to standardize the, st uh, the, the, the necessary kind of practice or reporting or, or back practice, et cetera, in the cloud service management domain. You know, you're at, so you're absolutely right. That's a huge and important problem. Um, so I would I would urge you to think about two two things. One, of the many groups Steve put on the slide there, I'm pretty sure there's some working group in some place addressing. There's some committee somewhere talking about that problem. So, so you know, uh, uh, you know, contact one of us or whatever and. I'll bet there's a committee that's working on a problem, maybe in the TMF even. But if if not, and you have some energy about that problem, you know, it, uh, I can I can tell you what it was like to get a, a, a working group started in the IEEE. It's not that hard. So if you have some energy about that problem, and, and there isn't a committee working on it somewhere, or you've got a community of people who want to try to move that ball forward. You know, that's what this is all about. Get it, get it started. Get Just it uh, briefly, I think TM4 might be a natural place because all the work they did with TMIP and the fact that they're getting involved in the cloud I think now. it's happening yeah. there. I, I'm pretty sure you're right, Joe. But, but you know, jo yeah. find the place, contribute, right? There, there's also some uh, discussion in, uh, in SC38 on, on this issue. Anyone else like to take a crack at this? It's a very, very good question. And, in fact, really, at the bottom of all of this cloud infrastructure, especially when we talk about intercloud <coughs> management, which usually gets short shrift in, in, in IT, is really is really the answer to uh, to facilitating uh, intercloud. We're not going to have intercloud unless some of these management issues are addressed. Anyone else I'm like to take that? that problem. Yeah. You should do uh, another thing I want to related to one is I also want to get the wisdom from the OpenStack, for example. We talk about open source, right? Uh, are we encouraging the open source community to develop a standard cloud service management modules or even services so that people can leverage them and compose them in the open manner? So this is one I also want to get into. I think today OpenStack provides a core set of services which a number of different service providers are implementing. And as I think commonalities emerge and patterns emerge in these implementations, the community will find it within its interests to uh, commit some of this code back to the core, you know, where that, where that helps interoperability. And so I think this is, this is the opportunity of a reference implementation that's widely adopted. Uh, having, uh, having a standard which is not widely used as a product is a recipe for failure. Having a product which has not, you know, had the opportunity for folks to uh, influence, uh, you know, how it works is also a recipe for failure. So I, th so I think there's an interplay uh, between the standards work that's going on and the adoption of this reference implementation across a large number of different uh, types of customer uh, deployments. Can, can I just add one last um, thought? It, it's not so much on that uh, topic. It goes back to a question a little bit earlier around, uh, you know, what you asked about will we have uh, standards or not. It just um, it seems to me that this is a hopeless situation. Uh, has nothing to do with cloud, right? Uh, because what it comes down to is, um, on the one hand, standards are bad if you're a uh, commercial firm because it moves the basis of competition to mere price. Uh, on the other hand, standards can be good if you are a commercial firm operating at a higher layer because they provide a platform for innovation. 
and there's the whole uh, innovate, leverage, commoditize model that Simon Wardley talks about, you know, where the point is that you create a platform for innovation, you let others extend that platform and create new features and services, and then you basically grab them, right? So, you know, Facebook and Instagram being an example of that. Um, and then you leverage that, bring it into the platform, and then that cycle continues. So standards are sort of bad <laughs> and to some extent good. Maybe it's good for other firms that are actually building on or if you're large enough that you can do the acquisition. Um, on the other hand, obviously, every single firm uh, has strategic planning sessions, you know, annually, quarterly, daily, whatever it may be, that says how do we differentiate ourselves in the market and um, you know the whole point is that you differentiate yourself not by building an exact clone replica of what everyone else is doing. Um, you come up with some crazy stuff. So I really like the uh, needless differentiation point that Chris mentioned from Andy Bechtelsheim. Um, but it, it's a dynamic tension that will never be resolved, right? So there there is no answer. It's just you know an evolving system of standards and differentiation and pulse treble at uh, IMD Lausanne talks about these two phases where in effect you have these uh, these epochs of convergence followed by epochs of differentiation. In the fashion business you have sequences that are differentiate, 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 differentiate. In some of the IT areas we've had more standard, standard, but then you know as you have standard laptops all of a sudden someone comes up with the netbooks which is differentiated then people copy that and so it's standardized then someone comes up with a tablet and it's differentiated etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it's just a never ending cycle so at least standards people always have jobs so i guess we'll see you here next year if that's a i didn't mean to close the event but that's almost like a you know a good statement to end things so, Joe, I, I want to push back uh, so that we're not all agreeing on, on, on things. I'd like to pre-disagree with your disagreement with my comment. <laughs> okay, well, you, you want to give the rebuttal now or, 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 or afterwards? <laughs> all right, fine, I'll wait. You know, you mentioned uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, and uh, I, I worked with Andy in the, in the old good um, Sundays in the late 80s and early 90s, and one of the strategies of Sun in those days uh, was that um, interfaces should be standardized, but not implementations. And that uh, if the interface standard is appropriately developed, then there's plenty of room to compete on innovation, and uh, compete and innovate on implementations. And so um, it seems I would pre-retract my disagreement with your statement. Well, I'm I'm not sure I'm 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 going to agree with your retraction. I think okay. uh, we should use. Uh, uh, mortal combat to resolve okay. this. No, but I, your point is well taken. So the, you know, the fact that the API exists, so if, in my mind I think of automobiles, the fact that we correctly drive on the right, Ayama-san, um, <laughs> and the fact that, uh, that there's a steering wheel that works and a you know, turn signal and we all know how that works and that's a standard doesn't mean that a Lamborghini isn't differentiated from a Hyundai. Let's right, say. so there's a perfect example of standard interfaces, you know uh, to, to push your right foot down. Uh, of course, I have a car with a clutch, so I find myself using the clutch on the rental cars I, I get that have automatic transmissions, but that doesn't do any harm, it turns out. So it's really a smart interface. And I think in the cloud space, if the interfaces are written so that people can innovate uh, on top of those interfaces so that value added can show, we can have proprietary implementations that generate value, that, uh, that generate uh, differentiation, and have the clouds hooked together, the inter-clouds hooked together, as we were talking about, several of us. So the counterexample to my non-rebuttal of your comment, which pre-disagreed with what I didn't say, is um, the IBM PC, right? So the extent that you had a Windows platform and PC, which was cloned, you know, you could say that you are can, you know, have a larger disk drive and, you know, a 3.2 megahertz clock versus 3.1. And the fact is it's still a highly price competitive business with extremely low margins. So, uh, you know, I think there's truth on both sides. Uh, let me ask another question about uh, InterCloud. And that is, uh, we, we, several, of us, several of us have talked about the importance of cloud-to-cloud -cloud interoperability. 
But often when I have this discussion with people, uh, they ask, is this just a technical uh, uh, research interest, or is this going to be the model for the bulk of cloud computing? In other words, if you fast forward 10 years, I'm asking you to make a prediction, or one of you, or several of you, is the bulk of the workload that is going to be running on clouds generated by other clouds? Or is the bulk of the workload going to be generated by one of us or one company sending up something to the cloud? I mean, you know, when you look back at big networks of the world, the history sort of, um, and you find the dynamics of them, the interoperability between these networks is really important. I mean, you know, we jump off an airplane and our phones work. And you can call any number. And you can receive a call. And a lot of that is the phone company to phone company interoperability, the signaling networks that are behind this. And this took a long time to develop, actually, if you track this, maybe 100 years, really, starting with the original telegraph. But this is a pretty important thing. And now, it was pretty difficult to imagine mobile telephony back when people were trying to just get long distance to work with wireline where s s signaling was invented. But, so I think the, 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 uh, qu the question at hand is, I think there's a natural, that was voice, internet was kind of data, you know, computing, storage, I mean, maybe we don't truly understand, or it's a more difficult thing to think about interoperability, but this will happen. The next piece of that interesting equation, though, is that we now have this other weird dimension, Steve, that you mentioned, is that you know, there's a lot more things on the internet than people right now. And so if you extrapolate that and you start to talk about what's gonna use a lot of computing and storage and so on in the future, it, it's things and it's things connecting to clouds and clouds connecting to other clouds. And so I, I kind of agree that this computing infrastructure of the planet is gonna be used in a way that's very difficult to predict. You know, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past the fact that some CAT scan machine needs compute resources somewhere to do its 3D modeling, and, and it will ask its cloud to go find the resources it, it needs to do that somewhere. And this is, you know, this is kind of the problem set we're ultimately trying to solve, right? But it's kind of like being the wireline guy, voice guys in the 60s, trying to solve phone company to phone company, country to country, long distance, and what it turns out to be is, is you know, this. It's hard to tell what that's going to be. So my counterpoint to that is... It's all just, about economics. It, yeah, true. The, uh, what I was just going to say is that I think voice is relatively simple, right? You know, once you agree on adaptive pulse code modulation or whatever, then you just can work out the interoperability. The challenge with IT is that as a general purpose technology, it's got infinite extensibility. And actually, Mark Teeley, who some of you may know, had a great quote, which is um, the notion that uh, you know, a developer is basically like a painter with a palette, and not only is uh, a painting that a painter does different than what a different painter does, but it's different than the same painting that he or she did the day before, right, even if it's trying to be an exact replica. Mm -hmm. So because you have that infinite complexity and infinite richness, um, the notion that somehow there's going to be some single Rosetta Stone or de facto standard that makes everything work together is, I think, a little bit of a challenge. And maybe a better analogy than voice, to my mind, is the fact that you have 500,000 applications or more uh, in the Apple ecosystem, and basically none of them work with any of the others, right? So you've got a combinatorial complexity problem, which, you know, n squared over 2, um, around interoperability of this infinitely rich set of applications, which means that, you know, again, the providing a foundation for interoperability is certainly key. Things like common identity, billing, you know, maybe cloud management, et cetera, but you're going to find every possible scenario. And the fact that after half a century we're still running TPF applications for airline reservations, I think is sort of the nail in the coffin of the point that you're not going to be migrating legacy applications over. And you can evolve that with data gravity issues and application coupling and timeouts and network and data centers and migration costs for physical infrastructure. Basically, the world of IT will continue to be a mess forever, and it's probably going to get worse before before we ever see it get better. Yes, Amazon, please. I would like to uh, make a 
proposal for the future conference, uh, you know, it's pretty crowded uh, because, you know, uh, mainly uh, three uh, communities are related to the cloud computing. One is uh, computer researchers community. Maybe uh, many people are, are in this uh, uh, community. And uh, uh, second is uh, network uh, community. And f for example, open flow or something like this. And third is the s applications uh, like uh, uh, medical, health, or government, and so on. So maybe these three uh, communities should uh, combine to realize the future, you know, uh, cloud computing, intercloud, and, and so on. So uh, next, you know, uh, conference, please invite uh, these different community and uh, talk with each other. Uh, I. Uh, I am feeling that uh, in the GICTF, my you know forum, there are two community mainly, uh, network and uh, uh, computing. Uh, it is very difficult to communicate each other, uh, computer people and networking people. It, it, very difficult. Uh, it is not so good uh, for cloud computing, and uh, so we. Uh, would like to uh, combine these, you know, different community. Wonderful suggestion. Panelists, last uh, remarks? Great panel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Please give the panel uh, your uh, applause.